India and China appear headed for a period of diplomatic chill over the Dalai Lama's visit to Arunachal Pradesh. In a sense, India has drawn a line in the sand, as it has in the past, that Arunachal and for that matter, Tawang are forever a part of India. To explore some of the issues connected with the Dalai Lama's visit, I have with me Mr. Lobsang Sange, Prime Minister of the Tibetan Government in Exile. Sir, welcome to this interview and Tashi Delig. Oh, Tashi Delig. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, there's a lot of um, uh, noise coming out of China, you know, um, warnings, uh, some would call it threats, intimidation. What is it that worries the Chinese about the Dalai Lama's visit? This kind of threats and worries and the noises that they make is the usual drama, you know. They're just trying to make mountain out of molehill because His Holiness Dalai Lama uh, is a spiritual teacher to thousands of you know, people in Arunachal Pradesh and Tawang. So at their request, he's going there to bless them. Uh, so you know, they've been waiting earnestly for several years. And uh, you know, it's uh, surprising uh, that China, is, as the you know, second largest economy and the second largest military and very powerful country, is threatened uh, by a simple monk called His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He's just a, an advocate of nonviolence and compassion. And uh, we all have met him. Uh, so, you know, he's just a simple Buddhist monk. But I think this giant China is threatened by him. Some reports have referred to China using military means, you know, to um, convey their displeasure to India. Uh, what are your sources in uh, Tibet telling you? No, we haven't heard, uh, you know, anything unusual. But I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if uh, Chinese use some military maneuvers uh, to send a message. But that's the usual thing that they always do. Uh, you know, His Holiness have met with presidents of you know, many countries around the world, including presidents of the U.S. They always make this kind of noise and do a few things. Mm -hmm. But once a meeting takes place, and after that, they just go quiet. So I think uh, that's what's happening. Uh, regarding his visit to Arunachal Pradesh. Yeah. I really don't see anything unusual happening. In your understanding and um, given the fact that you have studied the Chinese closely, do you believe the Chinese could uh, be provoked into a war over Arunachal? I really don't think so. Um, because, you know, Arunachal Pradesh was not an issue in 60s, uh, 70s and 80s and only in, you know, some 2000, 2005, they made it an issue. And it's such a small place uh, to go, you know, declare war or have war over, actually. Yeah. It's just a small, peaceful uh, place where there are a lot of Buddhists. And uh, what they're doing is they want to see their guru. Uh, they want to see the spiritual guru come and teach them and bless them. It's just a nonviolent, you know, very compassionate way of conducting things. In that sense, it's surprising that China is threatened by non-violence and compassion maybe? I was in China some years ago and I recall one of their uh, um, important analysts and scholars saying that uh, the claim over Arunachal was only a bargaining point. Uh, their real interest is in Tawang. Would that be correct? I don't think so actually, you know. Uh, you know they make that kind of, uh, you know, noise and they have this kind of grand strategy and trying to get something. But uh, Arunachal Pradesh or Tawang is a settled issue, you know, as per the Simla Agreement in 1914, which was signed between uh, Tibet, government of Tibet, and British India at that time. So on the sideline, they also had demarcated a border, and it's called Megmohan Line. And at that time, China did not object on the border between India and Tibet. Their objection was more a borderline between Tibet and China. So even that historical documents clearly show that it, Tawang or Arunachal Pradesh was not an issue for the Chinese government. So is this um, a kind of indication of their um, growth as a, as a nation with a lot of power, military muscle? Uh, it reflects the size of their foreign exchange, um, uh, you know, revenues or whatever. Is this about hegemony? Uh, in some sense, you know, you know, we have been saying that if you want to understand China, you must understand Tibet or Tibet narrative or Tibet story. Once you understand what happened to Tibet, you will truly understand China. 
So when Tibet was occupied, we said we are occupied, help us, all the neighboring countries. And around the world, they said, well, it happened to you. You are an exception. Good luck to you. It will not happen to us. So with that belief, they kept quiet. Now what you see in South China Sea, East China Sea, border incursion in India or Nepal or anywhere. Now everybody, all the neighboring countries are saying, how come China is in our doorstep? So we've been telling you for 50 some years, it happened to us, it could happen to you. So no one believed us or supported us for all these years. Now the reality is, you know, it's, China is in your doorstep. So it's part of the you know, assertive foreign policy and expansionist design, which they had. Do you expect, uh, you mentioned the word expansionist. Mm -hmm. you know? So do you expect a phase of um, expansion now, given the fact that they've been doing some of that in South China Sea, Nine Dash Line and all that, do you expect to see something of that kind opening up on our part of the uh, frontiers? I think in all the frontiers, you know, uh, Chinese expansion is designed, uh, some, some are overt, some are covert. And it is uh, one Chinese uh, person told me, Chinese foreign policy or the expansion design is sometimes like, you know, uh, you know, you have a piece of paper, they will say, okay, can I put a drop of oil on your piece of paper? Only a drop, you say, okay. And uh, China puts a drop of oil. Next morning, you realize the drop has spread to all your paper and they claim the whole of your paper. Uh, similarly, you can clearly see all the countries bordering China. I was told by uh, someone, that's like, this is like 15 years old data. In all the ASEAN countries and neighboring countries, there are 300 Han Chinese, Mandarin speaking high schools inside the border of all these countries, meaning Chinese people have moved in to the northern part or inside of all these countries, that there are 300 high schools to cater to Han Chinese from China. So for example, Burma, Mandalay is one of the biggest cities actually in Burma in up north. It's majority Chinese, so on and so forth. So it's like the you know, the drop of oil expansion. And then you can look around. You look at uh, Sri Lanka, a seaport built there, in Pakistan, seaport built there, uh, in Bangladesh, in Nepal. Nepal is the only other Hindu country in this world. And they are leaning towards China, at least some parties are leaning towards China. Uh, so on and so forth, you can clearly see that the expansion design is such that they are uh, all over uh, South Asia and ASEAN countries and East Asia in Africa. So it, it, it started with us, Tibet. So when we say it happened to us, help us. So all the neighboring countries said, good luck to you. It will not happen to us. Now, I read people in Taiwan and Hong Kong and some neighboring countries also saying, we don't want to be like Tibet. So we have become the reference point. We have become that chapter. They, they don't want to be repeated. But had China's expansionist design stopped, diluted, or prevented in 1950s in Tibet, this extended expansion that they are practicing now could have been diluted also, could have been, you know, lessened. Um, but now this is the reality, yeah. So you must understand what happened to Tibet to understand what will happen to you and to understand China. So in that sense, you will see a common thread linking China's actions, whether from the South China Sea or to our shores. Yes, it's the same template, it's the same blueprint. I was giving a talk, I think, in Mysore University. Two African students asked me, do you know, uh, do you, what do you make up of Chinese investment in Africa? And I said, well, uh, you know, do they build good roads? Uh, they said, yes. And do they build big entertainment centers? They said, yes. And do they co-opt your ruling elite? They said yes. And so they asked me, how do you know it happened to us? 60 years ago, it's happening to you. And then they said, oh, uh, Chinese roads are better than Indian roads. Yes, because it has to last till all your mineral resources, till all your trees are gone. <laughs> so it's a long lasting in roads. This is how, how it happened. Actually, when they came in, they built roads and told us that we, we are going to bring development and prosperity will flourish, you will benefit. And our parents and grandparents, in fact, helped build Chinese those roads. Once roads were completed, 
trucks came, tanks came, guns came, and took over our country. So now uh, in South China Sea, in all those islands, uh, what, they sh what they show us is that they're building airfields. They say, oh, there's a military airfield, what to make of it? Tibet, in Tibet, they have already built five military airfields, they're building the sixth one. So it happened to Tibet already. So it's happening in South China Sea. So if you study Tibet, you will understand what's happening to you. So Tibet is vital component, you know, that one must understand. Uh, I'm sure you have contacts with uh, Tibetans in Tibet. Mm -hmm. So what is it they tell you about their life over there? Do they speak of oppression? Do they speak of deprivation of various kinds? Yes. What do they tell you? No, the repression has intensified. For example, since 2009, but particularly since 2011, self-immolation. 146 Tibetans have burned themselves. And the latest was just a month uh, ago. So this sad chapter where Tibetans are burning themselves um, are caused by the repressive policies. Because if you have a simple protest in the streets, you get arrested, you are tortured, and you are imprisoned for a long time. So you suffer so long and so much. By the time you get released, um, you are either handicapped or you die. So hence Tibetans are saying, it's better to burn yourself and die than suffer for so long. So this is one example uh, that repression is very severe inside Tibet. And they are also destroying a very famous monastery called Larungar Monastery. 12,000 monks and nuns. As we speak, they are demolishing it. They want to reduce it to 5,000 monks and nuns. And this rest of the 7,000 monks and nuns have to pledge in writing that they will never come back to the monastery ever again. So where do they go? What do they do? Very sad, I think. You know, some are also forced um, not to practice religion at all, even in the local monasteries. So they are devastated, you know. But this kind of repression, even Mao Zedong himself said, repression will generate resentment. So Chinese government policies are the reason why there is huge resentment of Tibetan people against Chinese government policies. So this cycle has been continuing and more depression, more, rep more resentment. Do you see a situation where Tibet could be um, uh, liberated, freedom, autonomy of some kind? Do you see such a situation ever developing, say, over the next decade, 20 years? Definitely, yeah. I, I really see that. And that's our goal, that's our dream, and that's uh, what we are working at. Because ultimately, if China wants superpower, they ought to win the respect. You cannot buy respect, you cannot force respect. And they can gain respect if they settle the issue of Tibet peacefully. And as far as we are concerned, envoys of the Dalai Lama have had dialogue with the Chinese counterpart. They are willing to have dialogue with the Chinese counterpart to settle the issue of Tibet if Tibetans are granted genuine autonomy within China. So what we are saying is if Chinese government implement their own laws, we, will, we could take that as genuine autonomy. But, uh, you know, the hardline policies of the Chinese government have continued so far, and it's misguided, and it's wrong. They also know it, actually, but in their expansionist design, in their fervor of nationalism, uh, repressing a small number of Tibetans in their eyes, is the way to go. But I think it will not last. Uh, do you still have Tibetans coming over to India, you know, clandestinely, on their own? Till 2008, few thousands used to cross from the mountains of Tibet and Nepal to India. Now, they have, the only other Hindu country, Nepal, has come under tremendous pressure from the Chinese government. And Chinese are training their military personnel, their border patrol, their policemen, their security apparatus. Now they are preventing Tibetans from crossing the mountains. So when Tibetans cross the mountains, they have to face Chinese army, Nepali army. So it has decreased a few hundreds now, but still they do come. They come to India, so we provide them education. We provide them you know, monastic education as well. So we take care of them. And uh, do they, um I mean, what is the situation vis-a-vis -vis the uh, settlement of large number of Han Chinese in Tibet? 
I understand the population of Han Chinese is more than the Tibetan population. It depends how you define it. Uh, Tibet Autonomous Region, uh, you know, we call it Utsang. That has always been Tibetan majority. Now, our traditional definition of Tibet includes Amdo and Kham. Amdo is where His Holiness Dalai Lama was born, and Kham is where my parents are from. There, uh, in the border areas, Chinese presence have always been their biggest lowland. But nomadic and the village areas, Tibet has always been majority. So in urban areas, there are lots of Chinese, but in summer, they're surviving because of the subsidies given to them by the Chinese government. But in winter, Tibet is still a Tibetan majority. So, you know, we believe in global warming, but we want it to slow down. We don't want it to expedite. But as long as Tibet is cold and the mountains are very high, Han Chinese who are from plains cannot survive there. So Tibet is, you know, uh, ma Tibetan majority in winter. Once the subsidies are gone, I think majority of Han Chinese business will also leave Tibet. That's for sure. In that sense, yeah, we still have, you know, Tibet for Tibetan people. Do you have contacts with the Chinese uh, party, the Communist Party? Uh, I'm sure there are uh, some um, dialogue going on at various levels. Uh, do you get a sense sometimes that, uh, you know, um, there is a future there that we can resolve the issues that we have? Do you get that sense? No, when I was at Harvard uh, University for 16 years, I've organized many, you know, track two, track three dialogue between Chinese scholars and Tibetan scholars, so seven rounds, and also between His Holiness Dalai Lama and Han Chinese scholars. So all have gone well. So meeting some of them, I do feel, if explained properly, many Chinese understand Tibet issue because you know, they are fed propaganda through their news media, Xinhua News Agency or you know, People's Daily or CCTV. Then majority of them believe Tibetans are very happy and content. Mm. They actually believe that Tibet is a socialist paradise built by the Chinese government. Once they come out, they realize that the narrative is completely opposite. So once they come to know, there are people who understand that. But 99.99% of Han Chinese still uh, subscribe to uh, Chinese media and their propaganda is such that we are put uh, in a very uh, in a dark description. And meeting me, uh, you know, uh, personally, it's considered a bit, if I put it mildly, a bit tricky because they, they have to go back. But some Chinese journalists and scholars and Buddhists do come to Dharamsala and around the world. They do meet. We also meet sometimes and they have questions. We try to explain to them. Some of them believe and some don't. Um, but that's the, the process of dialogue. But at people's level, Tibetan students and Chinese students, Tibetan people, when they talk to each other, many Chinese, hundreds and thousands of Chinese, they, they, uh, they change their mind. And they say, oh, what's happening in Tibet is wrong. And uh, they ought to be granted basic freedom. That many, many Chinese, even they have written articles inside China also. Would you say the current uh, Chinese approach to Tibet is heavily uh, security um, driven? I mean, all in terms of you know keeping people down, police, oh, military. Yes. Very security driven. Um, they have uh, implemented a grid system where, you know, Every Tibetan is issued, uh, you know, a very high-tech ID card with chips in it to, you know, uh, track your movements. Uh, so biometric chips. Um, now, what happens when nomad, one nomad moves from the nomadic place to any of the town in and around Tibet? Once the check posts, once they swipe it, they will know which are the places you have been to, um, and they are tracked, and the surveillance cameras everywhere. Um, so that's one, infrastructure-wise. Other one is, you know, it's part of the same. Security and stability of China is dependent on security and stability of Tibet. So the neighborhood watch has been changed. Before, a neighbor of 100 families will have one committee watching. Now they have subdivided into five families or 10 families, and the head of that, you know, watch group will rotate. And it says, uh, the policy is, you know, if you want happiness, you must surrender 
your security, which means if you want subsidies, you must spy on your neighbors. So more information you provide of your neighbors or your own families, you get subsidies. So that's the policy. So it's very systematic and very repressive. That's why Freedom House Index have listed Tibet just above Syria and below North Korea as far as freedom is concerned. So that's in the whole world. Tibet remains the most repressed area. In fact, one, uh, the, I think, uh, uh, journalist group in China said that getting to Tibet is harder than getting into North Korea. That controlled, that repressive the system is. Do you foresee some kind of an uprising in Tibet against Chinese rule? Uprisings of all kinds are happening all the time in Tibet against mining, against deforestation, against hydropower, for religious freedom, for linguistic rights. But they are, you know, immediately they are repressed, bundled up and put in a car or in a truck and sent to prison. Even if you sing a song with some hidden meaning, you get arrested. If you compose a poem with some hidden meaning, you are arrested, put behind bars. So that how repressive the system is. What, uh, what happens when, um, I mean, this is uh, one of those questions that always comes up, you know, uh, looking ahead, uh, Dalai Lama, you know, uh, is there a successor? There's been some reports about perhaps the next successor being from India. What, I mean, how do you look at these issues? You know, whenever you ask a question to His Solemnness, mm -hmm. we must understand is that he is a highly trained and highly skilled a dialectic debater. So if you ask him a question, uh, he will always say yes or maybe. If you say, will next Dalai Lama be a woman? Maybe. Will next Dalai Lama be born in India? Maybe. Will next Dalai Lama going to be a Spanish or American? Maybe. Because in the realm of possibilities in next life, you can't rule this out. But practically and based on historical precedent, uh, I think he will be uh, you know, uh, a Tibetan uh, and a boy or a man. Uh, because all the Dalai Lamas have been men, and there are female reincarnation, and the female reincarnation will be female or woman. So that's president. And number two, uh, he is uh, very healthy. He has uh, survived or lived uh, fourth generation of Chinese leaders. Uh, he, he is very healthy. He will survive the fifth generation of Chinese leaders as well. So he is himself a cell. He will live more than 100 years. That's what we pray. That's what we hope. And it looks like he will live that long. So he will be there for a long time. Now, as far as successor is concerned, because he's 14th, there will be 15th Dalai Lama. So we cannot detach or separate Tibet and Dalai Lamas. They go together. So there is Tibet, there is Dalai Lama. So they, historically, we say, uh, means there is Chinese. So Chinese and Tibet. It's mystically, spiritually connected forever. So there will be 15 Dalai Lama. And he will do, uh, I think, as good job as the present Dalai Lama. So last question. <clears throat> what is it that you see um, India can do? Is India doing enough for Tibet? Now, as a guest, uh, as per Tibetan tradition, or also our Indian tradition, you never complain uh, against your host. So India has done the most for Tibetan people really Indian government, Indian people, Indian leaders, no country, no government has done that India has done. I was born and brought up in India. I got educated in India. Now I've you know, gone on to become the leader of the uh, Central Tibetan Administration. It's thanks to India and all my colleagues in the Tibetan Administration are born, brought up, educated in India. His Holiness calls himself son of India because he ate chapati and rice and dal for 57 years. I, I, grew, I was born in India and grew up in India. So my bone and blood is made in India. So hence, you know, uh, we say that uh, Prime Minister Modi ji uh, is, uh, you know, advocating make in India. The original made in India is the Tibetan movement because we follow Ahimsa, we follow Indian democracy, and India has supported us and uh, been very generous with us. So our success is India's success. 
And if you succeed in regaining genuine autonomy or basic freedom in Tibet, it will be also India's success. It will be a success of Gandhi's nonviolence and Ahimsa. It will be a success of India's generosity. So if Modiji and all the Indian brothers and sisters, if they really want to make, make in India a success story with a chapter in world history, it has to be the Tibetan movement. So we wish uh, the Indian government you know, recognize Tibet as one of the core issues, like China says is one of the core issues. And we wish uh, Indian government support the middle way approach, which is our policy, because the US government supports middle way approach. It does not contradict one China policy. So US can uh, support one China policy as well as middle way approach. And his Solon, the U.S. presidents can meet with His Solonist Dalai Lama and go on doing business with China. I think India can do the same. But as a guest, no complaints at all, but appreciation to this great nation and the people of India. On that note, Mr. Sangye, thank you very much for speaking to me on. Thank you very much. You are most welcome.